Hi, I'm Daniel Lin, a graduate student at the University of Virginia, and welcome to my talk. We all know that disks are the birthplaces of planets, and how the disks evolve to form planets depend critically on the disk mass. When observing the thermal emission of dust in the millimeter regime, the conversion of the integrated observed flux to the total mass depends on the dust opacity. For example, through this relation here, where m is the disk mass and kappa is the dust opacity. This is commonly used for large surveys, such as the Van Damme survey, and it allows us to constrain the mass budget for planet formation by characterizing the distribution of disk mass as seen in this plot. However, we see that the uncertainty in opacity directly corresponds to the uncertainty of mass. By adopting a lower opacity, the inferred mass can be higher or vice versa. There is a long-standing problem that the dust opacity is a very difficult quantity to determine. The most widely used opacity prescription can go back to Beckwith et al. 1990, with about 1400 citations by now. The Beckwith prescription sets opacity to be 0.023 per gram of gas at 1.3 millimeters, with an opacity index beta of 1. If assuming a gas to dust ratio of 100, this value is well above the calculated values for the diffuse ISM presented in Drain 2003. The discrepancy is expected because the grains might have some level of grain growth, as we can see in Osenkoff and Henning's model. Now, this is just a subset of many opacity models. Further unknown details, such as the grain shape, compositions, and size distributions make computation of opacity fairly difficult, and values can vary by an order of magnitude. Having empirical constraints on opacity is very much needed. One way to have a handle on opacity is if we know the optical depth and the column density along the line of sight. Qualitatively, we can express this relation for an edge-on disk as such, where tau naught is a characteristic optical depth, the column density along the line of sight is just the disk size r naught times some density rho naught. I will show you that we can easily measure the disk size and the characteristic optical depth from resolved images. As for rho naught, we can impose that disks cannot be too massive, or else it becomes gravitationally unstable. With these constraints, we can measure the opacity to within a factor of a few. Let me explain this using the HH212 protostellar system. The system is located in Orion at around 400 parsecs away. Towards the origin of the bipolar jet lies an edge-on disk that is embedded in a fairly massive flattened envelope with roughly 0.1 solar mass. The disk itself, HH212MMS, was first resolved with ALMA at band 7, with an ang angular resolution of 0.02 arc seconds, or just 8 AU. As a follow-up, we collected images from bands 6 and 3. Already we can see how optical depth changes from wavelength to wavelength. At the shortest wavelength, band 7, we see that the image is more extended relative to the latter two because of a higher, higher opacity. The band 6 resolution is more comparable to band 7, and we can see that the dark lane remains obvious until we reach band 3 where the optical depth is lower and the dark lane is not as prominent. For more direct comparisons, here's a plot of the brightness temperature along the major axis. Indeed, the width of the apparent disk decreases with longer wavelength. Furthermore, the peak of the profile increases with wavelength, but I'll explain that later. Just from this plot, we can directly see the transition from optically thin to optically thick regions of the disk. We know that if we look at the disk center directly towards the central star, it is in principle infinitely optically thick. As we look away from the center, we reach these outer wings where the region becomes optically thin and the brightness temperature drops sharply. This behavior is one advantage of an edge-on disk. We know that somewhere, the optical depth is one and the optical depth can be constrained by this profile. Before I go on to describe the full model, let me show the effects of characteristic optical depth. Building on the disk with finite radius R0, we assume a power law temperature profile, where the temperature at the disk edge is T0. By solving the radiation transfer equation, we obtain semi-analytical solutions to the brightness temperature profiles along the disk major axis. The center plot I'm showing here is the brightness temperature profile normalized by T naught 
as a function of the major axis that is normalized by R0. This way, we can directly see just the change of the profile shape by the characteristic optical depth. Remember that the brightness temperature is roughly the temperature at the tau equals 1 surface. So to the left, I'm showing the temperature in the midplane of the disk relative to T0. The black solid line is ta the tau equals 1 surface seen from the observer in the positive z direction. The tau equals 1 surface effectively obscures the material behind it, represented by the gray region. The vertical dotted lines are the locations in the major axis where the optical depth is 1, which separates the optically thin and optically thick regions. As we, uh, as we change the characteristic optical depth, the tau equals 1 surface shifts its location. When tau naught is large, we see only the very edge of the disk and obtain a very boxy profile because the brightness temperature is just T naught. As we decrease tau naught, the peak of the profile increases because we are tracing the inner region where the temperature is higher. The width of the profile starts to decrease because the region where it's optically thick becomes smaller. In general, the shape of the profile gives tau naught and the extent of the profile gives R naught. This leads to our next criteria. What is the amount of material along the line of sight? In essence, we need to know what rho naught is. A disk cannot have too much mass because it will lead to gravitational instability and the disk will either fragment or produce spiral arms to transport material such that the disk becomes gravitationally stable again. In terms of the tumor Q parameter defined here, this means that we have a limit of q greater than or equal to 1. Given a lower limit of q, we have an upper limit on the surface density. With a surface density known, we can obtain the midplane density from the scale height shown here. So after some algebra, we get the opacity expressed by the disk size, the stellar mass, and the characteristic optical depth. Now we impose the assumption that the disk has roughly constant tumor Q. This can occur naturally for disks that are marginally gravitationally unstable, which gives Q of order unity. For the case of HH212 MMS, it is probable that the disk can be in this state for the region that is probed. This is because the host star is a low mass star of only 0.25 solar mass, and the disk is fairly bright in millimeter continuum, indicating a lot of mass. Indeed, Tobin et al. 2020 also found that the tumor Q parameter is within 1 to 2.5 for the system. Motivated by this, we prescribe a disk model that assumes a tumor Q of 1. Even if it is not 1, we can at least have an upper limit to the density, which would mean a lower limit to opacity. Finally, we fit the, ma the major axis profiles to get the opacity from tau naught. Here is a result of fitting, which we can see that the constant Q model fits the data fairly well. So after all this effort, what we have then is the empirically measured opacity per gram of gas. Here's the opacity I showed earlier. Now, where does our measured opacity put us? Interestingly, it is right in between the Beckwith prescription and the calculations by Osakoff and Henning. The uncertainty due to just random noise is shown as the dark gray region, but the uncertainty that affects us the most is due to an uncertain stellar mass and an unknown value of constant Q. The upper limit of the gray region is where we adopt Q equals 2.5. From this aspect, the Beckwith prescription lies comfortably within our uncertainty, whereas the Olsenkopf and Henning model for at least the high density case is marginally consistent with what we have for band 6, but the value can be consistent for band 7. One notable difference is the opacity index. Our measured opacity index, or the slope, is more consistent with Beckwith's beta of 1, whereas the Osinkoff and Henning's model predicts a beta of 1.7. Based on the value and the opacity index, our results support Beckwith's prescription. Another point we can obtain is the temperature profile. Since we have multiple wavelength observations, we have many values of tau naught, which means many tau equals 1 surfaces. In this case, I'm showing three different values of tau naught. By obtaining the temperature at, different, at three different surfaces, one can easily constrain the temperature profile, um, or the temperature power law index little q.
in the case when um, the temperature Q is high, the inner region is very warm, and the contrast between the smallest tau and the largest tau is high. In the extreme case, when little q is small, essentially isothermal, the peak brightness temperature is the same for these three profiles. From this model, we can see directly why multi-wavelength observations of edge-on disks can measure the radial temperature, which can be difficult compared to face-on disks. By having multi-wavelength images, we probe different surfaces, effectively scanning the disk to obtain the temperature profile. After measuring the temperature structure, we can see that the HH212MMS is relatively warm. The temperature at the edge of the disk is 45 Kelvin. A possible implication is that young disks cannot completely inherit the chemical composition from the molecular core. The temperature of more than 45 Kelvin is much higher than freeze-out temperatures of ices, like CO, where the freeze-out temperature is around 20 Kelvin, shown in the, dark, in the gray region. In this case, the chemical routes to um, deplete CO by forming methanol on grain surfaces is unlikely to occur indicating a possible scenario, scenario of partial reset in disk chemistry. I'll summarize the talk by the following. The new multi-wavelength images of HH212MMS shows an optically thick, warm embedded disk. By assuming marginally gravitationally unstable disk, one can measure the opacity to within a factor of a few. The opacity is consistent with the conventional Beckwith et al. 1990 prescription. And lastly, the disk is so warm that CO freeze-out is unlikely to occur. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.